We are now going to move on from perfectly flat mirrors to curved mirrors, particularly spherical mirrors. And by spherical, we don't mean that we have an entire sphere, but we have a segment of a sphere. And you can have a reflective surface on the outside segment of a sphere, and that would be called a convex mirror. And if you have a reflective surface on the inside of a sphere, we would call that a concave mirror. So you can think of a cave is an indention, so concave for the inside. For this first video, we are just going to look at concave mirrors, so we will come back to convex mirrors at a later time. And we want to look at how the rays will bounce off of a concave mirror so that we can figure out what type of images will be formed from a concave mirror. And first we're going to consider what happens to rays that are all parallel as they're coming into the mirror. And this is true for objects that are relatively far away. So you have this tree way over here, the light coming off that point on the tree spreads out in all directions. And if your mirror is small enough, or if the tree is far enough, or some combination thereof, the rays that will strike the mirror will be very nearly parallel. And get the object farther, like a distant mountain, they will be even more parallel. Or, as I mentioned in the previous video, if you have rays coming from the sun, they will be essentially perfectly parallel since they are coming from so far away. All right, now let's look at these parallel rays that strike our mirror. Now this mirror here has a lot of curvature. And what happens is each individual ray obeys the law of reflection, so it bounces off not at the same angle relative to the horizontal, but the same angle relative to the perpendicular to the surface at that point. So let me see if I can draw a line here. So if we draw a line perpendicular to the surface coming out something like that, then go back and grab my pen here, then this angle here is going to be the same as this angle over here. So each one is going to obey individually the law of reflection. Now, what happens if I have a highly curved mirror is these rays will tend to converge, but not at exactly the same point. Some are converging out here and some way in here. So we're not able to get a nice image from a situation like this. We get what are called spherical aberrations. But if we have something like this where it's not as curved, then some of them are a little bit over here and some of them over here, but they are a lot more closely focused at a single point. The reason why we want them focused at a single point isn't because we want to stick our eyeball right here and observe where they're being focused. We need rays diverging from the same point in order for our eyes to interpret that as an image, just like these rays were diverging from that single point on that tree. So that's why we want them to focus to a sharp point because then they will leave from a sharp point and that's going to give us a sharp image. This is going to give us a blurry image. So for all practical purposes, we are going to treat our spherical mirrors as if uh, they are flat enough that they focus all the rays essentially to the same point. We're going to ignore this stuff. But if we have, if you are an engineer or something and you wanted a really perfect mirror, rather than having a spherical mirror, you can have a parabolic mirror and inexpensive telescopes and things, certain telescopes use mirrors to focus the light. They will have parabolic mirrors in there, but they're a lot more difficult to manufacture and so they're a lot more expensive. So a lot of optics just use uh, spherical mirrors because they're good enough. All right, let's zoom in on this picture here and define a few things. So this location where all the rays get focused that are coming in parallel. That's not where all rays are coming in. If I have some ray coming in like this, bounces off here, it's not going to get passed through the focus. This is only parallel rays. will all pass through the focus after they are reflected off the mirror. And so we call that location where they all are focused the focal point. And we draw it with an F in our equation. That one's pretty easy, right? Focal point. And we call, actually F isn't the focal point, F is the focal length. It's the distance from the center of the mirror to the focal point. So that is our distance F. We have this other distance out here 
this is the center of our sphere if we drew the entire sphere that would be the center of our sphere and we call this distance from the mirror out to the center of where where the center would be we call that the radius of curvature uh, because that basically defines how curved our surface is here. If I have a small sphere, it's going to be a lot more curved. If I have a very large sphere, the curve is going to be a lot uh, more gradual. And it turns out you can use a bit of geometry to show that the radius of curvature is always twice the distance as the focal length, or written another way, the focal length is half the radius of curvature. So we're going to use this quite a bit jot it down or commit it to memory, something like that. All right, now <clears throat> let's look at what happens when we make an image. So, so far all we know is that parallel rays, rays coming in parallel, um, and by the way, they're parallel to each other, but they're also parallel to what we call the principal axis of the mirror, which is the line coming out perpendicularly from the center of our mirror. So when I say a parallel ray, really that's what I mean, is parallel to this principal axis of the mirror. So that's all we know so far. Uh, but if we want to figure out what's going to happen to uh, the image produced in this mirror uh, for objects that aren't coming from infinity, so any far away object will produce an image at the focal point. But if I have an object that's closer, so this little arrow here represents my object. You can think of it as a little candle or something, and it's reflecting in the mirror. And if we want to figure out where the image is, we can trace some different rays, and where those rays converge is going to tell us where the image is located. So if we think of the rays that are coming off from the top of this, now there's a bunch of rays coming out in all directions, but we're only going to consider three different rays, and actually we only need two to figure out where they converge, but we like to look at these three for whatever reason, maybe just as a uh, additional check that we got the first two right. So if we have the ray coming off straight, um, parallel to the principal axis, we already know where that one's going to go because we found that all parallel rays go through the focus. So we draw a ray here that's parallel and then we bounce it off through the focus and keep extending it on this way. Okay, a little arrow is showing the direction of travel of our ray of light. Now, if this ray of light were bouncing the other way, it would go through the focus and hit and, and after it bounces, it would come parallel. So we can draw a ray that does that, essentially, that comes from our object, goes through the focus, and we know if it was coming this way and was parallel and bounced through the focus, going the other way, it bounces out parallel. And here is where they intersect. So we already know that this is where the image of the top of our object is going to be. Um, because we're looking at rays coming from the top of that object. Stop erasing my dot, stupid computer. Okay. Now, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Anyway, we can draw a third line, a line that goes directly at the perpendicular to the mirror, because that one is going to reflect directly back on itself through the object, and it should uh, cross at exactly the same location. So all three of these rays parallel through the focus, through the focus parallel, and directly straight at the mirror and back will be located here. And if we did that same analysis for all points along this object, they would uh, focus at the corresponding locations of the image. This one here at the bottom of the object, that would go straight out and straight then. Now we wouldn't be able to send uh, one parallel, but uh, if we did some careful drawing, we would have this guy pop out here and then through the bottom there. So basically when we know the location of the top of the image, um, then we can just figure out that the rest of the image is going to follow suit and end on the principal axis. So this helps us figure out uh, the types of images we can get for different types of objects. And let me show you some, actually no not yet, I'll show you some other applets where you can play around with this stuff a little bit. Okay, let's look at some equations. So this is the same diagram, <clears throat> and using a bit of geometry, 
Uh, oh, I guess I forgot to mention some other aspects of this diagram. So we already know the focal length is f, and that's the distance from the middle of our mirror to the focal point. We also define the object distance, which I mentioned previously with plane mirrors. That's the distance from the mirror to the object. And then we have the image distance, which is the distance from the mirror to the image. And you get this nice equation here. You can derive it with a bit of geometry. It's done in your book if you really want to see that. I'm not going to take the time here to do it. But it's called the mirror equation. And you got infer inverse of object distance plus inverse of image distance equals inverse of focal length. You can't just invert this whole equation. If there was just one fraction on each side, you could. But because you're adding these fractions over here, you can't do this. No, no. Bad, bad, bad. Okay. Uh, we also have another property that we are going to deal with, M, which is called the magnification, which, as you might guess, is whether the image is larger or smaller than the original object. We saw with plane mirrors that the image was always the identical height. And we define the magnification as the ratio of the height of the image to the height of the object. So for a plane mirror, they were always equal, and you always get a magnification of 1. In this case, you get the image is larger than the height of the object. So you could have a magnification of 2 if it's double, or 3 if it's 3 times larger. And because of similar triangles, this height here and this distance is your object distance. That triangle is similar to this height here and the image distance. So you can also find magnification by taking the ratio of the distances of the image and the object. This negative sign here is essentially a sign convention. We use this to determine whether the image is flipped or not. So for magnification, a negative sign doesn't mean it got smaller. Uh, if something got smaller, the magnification is between 0 and 1. If it's greater than 1, then it got larger. The negative sign indicates that the image is upside down compared to the original object. If it's positive, then it is right side up compared to the original object. So what we do is <clears throat> whenever we have object distances on the left hand side of our mirror or what we, may, what we might call the front side, these are going to be positive object distances. And image distances are also going to be positive when they're on the right hand, or, sorry, the left hand. I think I said the right hand up here. So left hand sides of the mirror or on the front of the mirror. Those distances are going to be positive. We can get images over here on the back side, and those distances we will call negative image distances. Okay, so if we're plugging into our magnification equation here, this is going to be a positive height, and if it's inverted, we're going to have a negative value for that height. So that would be negative, that would be positive, and our magnification would come out to be negative, which tells us that this is flipped over. And if we're plugging in our object and image distances, those are both positive on this side. So we've got a negative sign in there already to show that it is flipped. Now if my image is over here, um, then my image distance is negative. So that's going to cancel out this negative, and we're going to get a positive magnification. The heights are both positive, so this would also give us a positive magnification. So that's a situation where it won't be flipped over. OK, now to the applets. Uh, this won't let me, YouTube won't let me hyperlink these, but here's what they look like. And I'll uh, try to remember to put these in the description so you can copy and paste them easier if you want to go play with these things. You do have to possibly monkey with your Java settings and go, go into the security and put these on an approved list is what I had to do because Java is getting kind of crazy with security lately. All right, so a couple of different applets. Actually, I want to start with this one. So this is the same idea as what we saw um, with our object and our image, but now I can move it around. So what we looked at before was a situation like this. Now this is showing more than just those three rays. It's showing a bunch of rays that would be pretty tricky to figure out. I guess if you had like a protractor and a ruler, you could draw all of these. But this is actually what's happening. There's rays coming out in all directions, hitting the mirror, bouncing off, and all of them converging at that point. Now, if you wanted to see this image, you couldn't look right here because these 
rays are converging and your eye can't focus converging rays. So what you would have to do is you would need your eyeball back here so that these rays would be diverging from that point where they focused and then you could see the image inverted sitting right here. This is what you would look in the mirror to be able to see this image. So that's what we had. Uh, let me jump back here. That's why they had this eyeball looking here. You don't want the eyeball over here. You wouldn't be able to see it. But if you're over here, you've got these nice diverging rays coming from a single location, so you're going to get a sharp image. There's going to be diverging rays coming from every point along this image, and you will be able to focus those and see an image of this object. Okay, uh, I keep jumping to the wrong one. Now, if we move our object around, uh, the location of the image will change. By the way, these dots right here, this is the focus and this is the radius of curvature. So as I get closer to the focus, that image distance grows and the image magnification also grows. As I come back here, you'll notice when I'm right on the radius of curvature, they have the exact same uh, height. The image height equals the object height. If I pull back further, now it's going to be smaller and it will continue to get smaller. Okay, I'm gonna jump to the other one now because it's only showing uh, three rays, those three that we talked about actually, this this third one here is different than the one we talked about. This is the parallel one that goes through the focus, the one that goes through the focus and comes out parallel. And we drew one that bounced and hit the mirror, let's see, I guess it would have to like bounce out here and then down there. But they drew one, there's one that will always reflect symmetrically off the middle of the mirror as well, so that's another option if you want to draw some of these. <clears throat> so as we saw before, they're going to be equal right there on the radius of curvature. It's going to be bigger out there, smaller out here. And what happens when we get too close so these are converging way out there, and we get to the point where they don't converge at all. If we are closer than the focus, essentially the mirror isn't powerful enough to focus those rays that start out so divergent. Uh, so they will never focus over here, but they will be diverging rays, and that's just what your eye needs to make an image, is diverging rays. So we get an image on the other side of our mirror, and in this case, it doesn't get flipped like it did over here. Uh, and it's always going to be magnified when it's on the other side there. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is what we call a virtual image because we are, we're kind of tricking our mind to think that the rays came from this location, but there were no light rays ever actually at this location. Whereas over here, we call this a real image because the light rays actually did pass through the point where we're seeing that image. Now if you actually look at these images in a mirror, you can't really tell that one is behind the mirror and one is in front of the mirror. If you kind of move the mirror side to side, you can tell with parallax a little bit, but it's kind of tricky. Uh, but if you have a laboratory setting, you can kind of measure these things. Um, but this is called a real image. This is called a virtual image. And if you want to pause the film and go grab a spoon, you can, you can actually see these things. So if you look on the inner surface of the spoon, and if you hold the spoon out, so in this case the object is you, uh, if you hold it out then you will see a shrunken image of yourself and you might be able to see your whole self actually if you hold it out at arm's length. As you pull that spoon toward you, essentially you're shrinking the object and the <clears throat> mirror distance, so the object distance is getting smaller. Then this is going to grow. You might say, hey, Mr. Juicy, you said that you're always the same size in a mirror. Well, that's only for a plane mirror. If you have spherical mirrors, you're not always the same size. Um, <clears throat> so as you get closer and closer, you are going to get bigger and bigger in that mirror. Also notice that you are inverted in this case. Now when you get closer and closer, eventually things might get a little fuzzy around here when nothing's really focusing well. And then if you get really close, depends on the spoon, but you might have to hold this like almost right up to your eye. And you will see an upright image of your eyeball. Maybe blink and you can tell that it's your upper eyelash is not inverted. Um, and so you can see this with a, a spoon acting as a concave mirror. All right, so let's summarize all of this. this. Sorry this video is a little long. There's a lot to go over. And we're going to have a lot of these similar analyses for other types of mirrors and lenses. So all of this stuff is going to apply to a lot of situations. Let's jump back to our PowerPoint now. Um, 
let's go look at this. So this is just kind of summarizing all of the different types of images you get from concave mirrors. This uh, might be a useful thing to throw in your notes or uh, if you use it enough you kind of just get a feel for this and then you're in good shape. But uh, if we look at the different object positions past the radius of curvature, between the radius of curvature and the focal length, and closer than the focal length. Those are kind of the three different options we have for what's going to go on with our images. In all cases, the sign on our object lengths are going to be positive because we're always on the left-hand side of the mirror, at least the way we're drawing the situation. Okay, The image distance, if we are past the focal length, whether that we're uh, beyond the radius of curvature or not. As long as we're past the focal length, our images are going to be on the same side as our object, and so those are going to get positive signs in our equations. That positive sign on the image distance tells us that it is a real image and that it's an inverted image, because when we plug into our magnification equation where we have negative di over do. If they're both positive, this is going to come out negative, which tells us it's inverted. Also, the fact that they're both positive tells us they're on the same side, so that makes it a real image. The magnification, though, isn't always the same between these two situations. If we are past the radius of curvature, it will always be smaller. And if we are between the radius of curvature and the focal length, it's going to be larger. If we're right at the radius, they're going to be equal sizes. And by smaller, I mean the magnitude of the magnification, that's a great phrase, is going to be between, be between 0 and 1. Now it's always going to be negative, uh, but it'll be, be the magnitude will be between 0 and 1. If it's larger, that means it's going to be greater than 1. And by greater than 1, I mean uh, less than negative 1, essentially, because it's going to be negative. All right, if we are closer than the focal length, that was that situation where we couldn't focus the rays. So the image jumps to the other side of the mirror we get a negative sign on our image distance, which tells us that it is upright instead of inverted. That negative sign also tells us that it's a virtual image. The rays didn't actually come from that location. Um, and they are always going to be magnified. You're never going to have a smaller image uh, when, it's, when it's a virtual image on the other side of the lens. Let me jump back to this for one more second here. So. If you notice, always smaller, same size, always larger, always larger. Once again, by this virtual real thing, it's a little confusing at first. We're going to do a lab that will hopefully help clarify this for you. But another way to think about it is if I put a screen, like a white screen or movie screen, at this location behind the mirror, nobody would see anything on that screen because there's no light rays actually going there. Whereas here, if I put a screen right here, these light rays would be focusing right on that screen. So if I put my eyeball over here, now they would be bouncing off the screen, diverging from the screen. And I could actually see an image on a screen for a real uh, image. But if I have a virtual image, that's something you couldn't see on the screen. You have to be over here, and you can just, your, your brain extrapolates these lines to think that they came from here, but they didn't actually come from there. Whereas when you're looking at this, whether you have it bouncing off a screen and your eyes over here, or whether there's no screen and your eyes just here and you're seeing it, uh, either way, the image you're seeing, the light rays actually passed through that location. Okay, thanks for enduring with me.